In 2011, I was laid off from my job as a historian with a nonprofit. I was old to be looking for a new job, and historian jobs are hard to come by anyway. So against my nature, I took an entrepreneurship class and with a colleague, Sarah Schoenfeld, started a company. We named it Prologue DC, as in the past is Prologue. We also got going on a research project we'd been thinking about for a while. The city was changing in unimaginable ways. Money was flooding in. People were moving in, especially young white people. Housing prices were rising like crazy, and the term gentrification was being thrown around a lot. I first ran across racially restrictive covenants in the 90s while researching racial turnover on S Street near DuPont Circle. In case you don't know, a racially restrictive covenant is sentence that a developer might insert into a property deed, prohibiting rental or sale to African Americans or sometimes others. These are very common around the United States in the first half of the 20th century. Here's one from 1908, and it's for a house in Columbia Heights. You can see the language, uh, never rented or sold, etc. And it applied to anyone who would ever own the house. These restrictions were happening <clears throat> at the very same time that African Americans were moving out of the South by the hundreds of thousands to find better lives in DC and other cities. DC was expanding overall, but most new housing was being built for whites only. That meant that African Americans were often confined to overcrowded and substandard housing in the oldest sections of town. Developers weren't the only ones writing covenants. In the 1920s, white citizens associations started circulating covenants like petitions and filing them with the city. That way they could restrict whole streets or whole, even whole neighborhoods all at once. In fact, what I came across on S Street was a lawsuit over one of these petition covenants. It was filed in 1920, and soon after that, one of the signers uh, contracted with an African-American couple to sell her house to them. A guy up the street got wind of it, and he sued to stop the sale, and he won. They appealed, but he won again. The judges said that discrimination was fair because African Americans, after all, were equally free to discriminate. About 10 or 15 years ago, Sarah and I and another colleague, Brian Kraft, were all researching different DC neighborhoods, and we all came across racially restrictive covenants. We wondered how widespread were these things. In 2014, we decided to find out. Sarah and I would do the research, and Brian would map the properties with covenants. We decided to call the project Mapping Segregation in Washington, DC. Well, it soon became clear that reading through hundreds of thousands of property records was going to take a very long time, maybe the rest of our lives. But we'd already started, so we continued, and pretty soon we had a spreadsheet with 10,000 properties on it. Brian mapped them, and even though it was far from complete, we could see that large sections of the city had been reserved for whites. We could also see that developers had been allowed to shape not just the city's built landscape, but also its racial landscape. The developers are the blue patches. But people fought covenants. That lawsuit on S Street turned out to be one of many. We did a little research, and we came up with about 50 lawsuits in DC. And we're talking neighbors suing neighbors. S Street was typical. One person in a house with a covenant would try to sell to African Americans. And there was an incentive to do this, by the way, because tight supply meant African Americans would pay much more. Then another neighbor would sue 
to stop or reverse the sale, and usually the courts upheld the covenants. We mapped the 50 lawsuits, and then we laid the lawsuit map, the lawsuits are the pins, over the covenant map, and then over a map showing demographics. This is 1934. Lo and behold, some patterns emerged. We could see that about half the lawsuits occurred in a single neighborhood, Bloomingdale. It's about two miles north of the Capitol above Florida Avenue. Many of the other lawsuits occurred in nearby neighborhoods. Covenants, if, if covenants were an attempt to keep African Americans out of certain neighborhoods like Bloomingdale, they were also an attempt to keep them in certain other sections of the city like around Howard University. And then these lawsuits were occurring along the artificial racial boundaries created by the covenants. The NAACP had tried for years to get a covenant case to the Supreme Court, and finally it succeeded. In 1948, the highest court ruled that racially restrictive covenants could no longer be enforced by any court. The decision was unanimous, except that only six justices participated. The other three recused themselves because, guess what, they lived in houses with covenants. Nevertheless, this was a great victory over legal segregation. On the other hand, segregation didn't just go away. Racially restrictive covenants had set patterns, and in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration reinforced these patterns and, and actually promoted segregation, and so did the banking and real estate industries. Banks would refuse to lend to certain people and in certain neighborhoods. This was called redlining, and it's still a problem today. The impact on African Americans, and therefore on all of us, has been severe. For most of us, the way to build wealth is through real estate, and here a large segment of the population was being kept out. That's one of the reasons why today the wealth gap in the DC metropolitan area is so huge. The average white family here has 81 times the wealth of the average black family. That's right, 81 times. But back to the 1950s, after covenants fell, and even more after schools were legally desegregated, white families moved to the suburb, suburbs in droves. In fact, they were being enticed to the suburbs with affordable and segregated huge new housing subdivisions, and also lots of new roads so people could easily commute back to the city to work. The neighborhoods they left behind, some of them turn from all white to all black almost overnight. Investment in the city dried up, schools and everything else fell apart. Businesses left the city too and they took jobs with them. Many people think that the riots of 1968 were the start of the city's long decline. Actually, the riots were a reaction to years of decline and to disinvestment and to indifference on the part of the city's white power structure, triggered by the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. When large-scale investment finally re started returning to the city in the 2000s, these same neighborhoods were ripe for redevelopment. Unfortunately, many of the people who lived through the hard times haven't been able to stay because they can't afford to. Take a look here. The slide on the left shows the corner 14th and V in 2008. There's a for sale sign hanging up, hanging from the top of the building near the corner. And on the right, same corner today, it's an upscale restaurant with a craft cocktail bar and a sidewalk cafe. One block up from there, 14th and W, on the left, that's 2008. And on the right, today, there are boutique condos on the corner, and then a bank and a sake bar. As they say, the past is prologue. Racially restrictive covenants set patterns of segregation that were reinforced by the federal government and by the banking and real estate industries. Their practices 
led to decay in many DC neighborhoods, priming them for the gentrification we're seeing today. Maps tell stories that words cannot. These maps show us how we got to where we are. Now let us use them going forward to break the patterns of the past. Thank you. Thank you.